you very much. And thank you so much for coming. So, so my name is Dr. Joanne McCormack, and I'm a GP from Warrington in Cheshire. And I qualified in 1986, so 31 years ago. And until five years ago, and, and a bit beyond that, a bit nearer to, than that, I practiced in the standard way that GPs practice. I listened to patients, I tried to help them, I prescribed drugs where I thought it was appropriate, and I never did anything to do with what we eat, because I thought it was rude, and because I thought it was unhelpful, and I thought I shouldn't interfere. And I also thought it didn't make any difference. So I'd like to read you out an email I had this week from a patient. Not sure if you can help here. Hopefully you remember me as the recently diagnosed type 2 diabetic, brackets, 23rd of February 2017, who has been to a number of your sessions in Stockton Heath. I've rigorously followed your advice and my blood glucose is now averaging 5.5 across the board. Weight dropping from 13 stone 10 to 11 stone 7. So that's over 2 stone in 4 months. All this due to careful monitoring of daily blood glucose levels from my test strips to see what reaction I have to certain foods. I have a haemoglobin A1c blood test due on the 19th of June, which is then over three months from diagnosis. After six weeks, it was down from 113 to 66. <coughs> now, I couldn't have ever imagined that in the past. Uh, at the most, I might have got a 10% reduction I certainly uh, wouldn't have been hopeful about him losing weight. And what's more, he's got great hope for himself, and we place, place great trust in hope. So this is what he says next. I'm hopeful that I can get it down to 35 to 40. Relax my blood glucose testing and come off metformin. So that's the sort of thing that can be achieved. Um, the other night I was in a pub talking to patients, uh, they had a separate room set aside. I wasn't competing with all the people talking and ordering at the bar. <laughs> and out of the audience of about 25, there were two people who had reversed their diabetes. And one of them is here today. <laughs> now, you'll remember at the beginning he said, not sure if you can help here. But one of the receptionists accidentally said to him that he couldn't have any blood glucose testing strips because it's been common practice in the NHS not to give them out to people who are just on metformin. Uh, but my practice had agreed to do that, so when I drew their attention to it, they did provide him with blood glucose strips. So the first thing I want to say is that we need to talk about food. Um, you need, how many of you are GPs? Hi, yeah, yeah. So how many of you are nurses? Yeah. How many of you are nutritionists or dietitians? Yeah. How many of you are members of the public? Brilliant. <laughs> Fantastic. So I'm going to talk to you about how to talk to your GP about food. Okay. And how... <laughs> how many are farmers? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so food is really important and, and when I speak to people about food, it's important to find the right words. So um, have any of your GPs asked you about what you eat? Put your hands in the air. Okay, so we're probably doing better than five years ago. And uh, which words did they use? I don't know if Sam, you might need the microscope. What, uh, mi the microscope, the, uh, yes, the, the uh, yeah. Microphone, yeah. Okay, you can't eat that, okay. What was that in relation to? Saturated fat. saturated fat. Okay, how many people go to the supermarket and buy a tub of saturated fat? <laughs> okay, so this is about real food. Okay, so, so somebody else want to say what their GP said to them? A balanced diet. Oh, okay, a balanced diet. I did ask what that was. Is that 10% count or 60% count? What did your GP say? Uh, it was one cup then. It was, it was a balanced diet. Okay. It would be fine. Okay, right. Your, your bloodstream's got about a teaspoon of glucose dissolved in it. So, so moderation in relation to a teaspoon of glucose is what? A tenth? A fifth? You know, there's an awful lot of glucose that comes out of food, especially if you eat carbs for breakfast, carbs for lunch, and carbs for tea. 
Um, okay, so, so I've started talking to people about food. And when you go to your doctors, do talk about food. And, and one of the easiest things to say to your doctor is, and they won't blink and they'll think, why have you bothered telling me this, is I eat real food, doctor. And I don't eat processed food that's been made in a factory. And they'll say, and. So what? They won't be bothered at all. But if you say to them, I eat LCHF, they'll think, <laughs> bit of a fad there. And if you say you eat a ketogenic diet, some of them will get worried about something called ketoacidosis. Oh, you're all saying about that. So ketoacidosis is a rare condition that happens in diabetics who are on insulin uh, when the ketone levels go far, far too high and they end up being admitted to hospital. But the sort of ketosis you get with simple real foods with a bit of a sort of healthy fat bias is just very, very mild and will help you lose weight if you've got weight to lose. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so I want to talk to you a bit about what people eat because I don't want to go around and, well, I might say to you, what do you eat for breakfast? So somebody like to volunteer. How many of you actually have breakfast? Okay. How many of you never have breakfast? Brilliant. How oh, interesting. Okay, so, so that's actually a higher proportion than in my groups. So I say to people who don't have breakfast, well, if that's good for you, you don't feel unwell, you don't feel hungry in the mornings, fantastic. Uh, and go with the flow. Don't feel you have to eat breakfast if you don't, if you don't usually. Um, what about um, what you have for breakfast? So of those of you that eat, who eat breakfast, who has cereal? So you're all, I'm preaching to the converted here. <laughs> or else these are... Uh, <laughs> Okay. Uh, does, does any, is anybody in transition? Oh, how, who follows low carb, high fat already? Or? Okay, the vast majority of you. Is anybody thinking about it but hasn't started yet? Okay. Right, so, so most of you have, have given it a go. Well, um, that's, that's great, and uh, I'm glad you're thinking about it. So, um, so when I first learned about it, I thought, hmm, it sounds a bit simple. Um, can't imagine it makes much difference, but I'll give it a go. And, uh, and so I spent three months following a very mildly ketogenic diet, which is called Grain Brain. It's one of the many ketogenic diets around. And I felt fantastic by the end of it. It was amazing. And it was so good, I wanted to tell my patients about it. But I often got it wrong. And at the beginning, I'd get complaints from my patients. And uh, not that many, but some, and some written complaints. I came in with a sore throat, and the doctor asked me what I ate. <laughs> think, OK. Well, I'd sort of think. You've got 10 minutes. A sore throat doesn't take very long. Let's talk about something else. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so the practice didn't take the complaint terribly seriously. I didn't get told off or get reported to the GMC or anything like that. But it does make you feel a bit bad when you ask about food and somebody gets the back up. Um, so apart from food, we mustn't forget drink. So, and when I say to people, what do you drink? Often they say, I don't drink that much alcohol, doctor. And I was thinking, well, I was just thinking like tea, coffee, water, whatever. I wasn't necessarily thinking alcohol. Um, but, uh, but last week, my friend Louise, she's a GP in Manchester. And uh, my friend Louise, this is quite important, really, because we're all different. Our metabolisms are all different. And LCHF is something that you have to flex and make it right for you. You can't just have one plan, like Dr. Pearl Mutter's grain brain plan. Some people will do that and not lose any weight because their metabolism may need less carbs than he's suggesting. You know, he has two or three days a week where you might have rice or lentils. Uh, obviously, people could be vegetarian, vegan. You've got to find what suits you. But anyway, so back to my friend Louise. So Louise is a naturally thin person. How many people here are naturally thin? Yeah, we, we, we don't mind you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> OK, so, so I'm not naturally thin. I was actually quite chubby when I was four, and my mother told me I couldn't wear skirts. So Louise is a, no. oh, but, uh, Louise is a naturally thin doctor, and she used to think that overweight people were lazy and ate too much food. And she used to say, if only they'd eat like me and exercise like me, they'd be fine. And I would say, no, because that doesn't apply to me. Anyway, through me changing my lifestyle, Louise has come to realize we've all got different metabolisms. And so last week, when a young woman came in to see her, who was grossly overweight, and she'd known this young woman since childhood, she said, oh, gosh, you know, like, um, Celeste, what's happened to you? What's, you? You've really got very overweight. And, uh, and, uh, and this Celeste said, uh, oh, yeah, I have, actually. I don't eat. Do you know, Dr. Louise, the thing is, I don't eat any food. 
it's ridiculous. I mean, look at me, it's ridiculous. And in fact, that's why I don't eat any food, because I'm just getting fatter and fatter. And Louise said, rather than thinking she's lying, which she would have thought in the past, she thought, well, what are you doing then? And what are you drinking? So she said, well, every day I have 15 bottles of LucasAid. <laughs> and you just think, okay. So, so that was, and that was a conversation she wouldn't have had, uh, you know, going back, going back of th three or four years. You see, what happened was Louise saw the changes in me and she realised that people were different. And that's the thing, you're all different. And, and say to your GPs, if you've got GP friends, colleagues, nurses, dietitians, talk to your friends, family, professional colleagues, um, just talk to them about food and say, we are all different, we've got different metabolisms, we need a different approach, but nobody needs carbohydrates. Nobody needs bread, pasta, rice, potatoes. If a patient came to me and said, I don't eat any carbohydrates, doctor, and they named them all, I would say, good. Um, and, and what else do you want to say? No, I think and your point is, really. So, so I wouldn't be worried about that. And actually, that, if you go to your GPs and say to them you're following a real food, or say you want to tell them you're following a low-carb, healthy, fat way of life, uh, if they question it, say, do you know, in essence, doctor, it's just real food and it's just not processed food. And I'm not missing out on any essential nutrients because there are no essential carbohydrates. And they might say, oh, but your brain needs glucose to function. <laughs> and you'd say, do you know, and write this down if you don't know the word, there's this amazing process called gluconeogenesis and your body can make glucose from other foods. So, um, so that's what to say to them really. But in terms of drinks, um, what about, um, what's your favourite, you're all low carbers then, so, so what's your go-to drink, what's your favourite, name a few things, what do you like? Water, tea. <laughs> and it, did any, have any of you struggled with having like tea or coffee, you know, did that actually hold up your progress at all? A bit, maybe because of the milk in it or even if it's black? Mm, yeah. Okay, so I don't think of these as foods, I think, I call these manufactured products. So I haven't quite got to talking to people in, you know, when about, I, I, basically I say to people, tell me what you eat. And, uh, and say, talk me through an average day. Because if you say, tell me what you eat, a lot of people say, I've got a really good diet doctor. And I think, okay, tell me what really good means to you. Talk me through an average day. And uh, nearly everybody in my practice, which is a very middle class, well-off practice, says, uh, well, I have cereal for breakfast, or it could be porridge, I have some fruit in it, uh, I'll have coffee with milk. Um, or they'll say I have toast um, and you know jam or honey or whatever and, and virtually nobody eats real food like eggs, meat, fish, cheese, last night's leftovers, N virtually nobody eats real food for breakfast and so I've got a real problem with that particularly with children because I'm a children's safeguarding doctor it's a rule we have in England so you don't have it in all countries and children's safeguarding um, doctors are concerned with process management and training and so it's a big problem if our children are told and if you've got grandchildren if you've got children yourself get them away from manufactured products for breakfast and it's really difficult and and this week I was speaking to a young mum and, and uh, her son has got um, he's got sort of like a, an inflammatory condition of his heel that's not getting better and I was saying well he needs to heal so he needs um, real food he needs protein and fat because the trouble with the eat well plate or the pyramid is that we've ruled out the one essential macro macronutrient which is fat and put in a non-essential macronutrient which is carbohydrate and carbohydrates are useless for repair of your cells so i think this young boy needs proper food for breakfast and this middle class mom had plenty of money said ah but i'm just too busy and um and a lot of them say that, and I think they've been convinced by the food manufacturers that they're too busy. Because if you go on Twitter, how many of you do Twitter? Okay, that's brilliant. Unfortunately, when I went to a room of about 200 doctors, and it was, that same question was asked, two of them did Twitter. <laughs> and they need to get with the times, really. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so, um, yeah, so, so my parents did, used to cook as a cook breakfast so I struggle with these parents who don't make breakfast oh yes yeah, so I was saying on Twitter yesterday I cooked myself scrambled egg uh, 68 seconds so I put it on Twitter 60 you know I can do that's quicker than oats are simple and it certainly um, gives them gives, um, cocoa pops and milk a run for its money 
Okay, so we've got a disaster in plain sight here, which is why I'm really glad I've got so many members of the public here, because you're all really, really important in actually getting the message out to friends and family, colleague, work colleagues, your workplaces. I mean, how many of you have got workplaces where people routinely bring in cake and biscuits? Yeah, okay. So, so think creatively of ways around that. I'm not going to give you any answers here. Just think of creatively of ways around it. In my last practice, I persuaded them not to have any cakes or biscuits. And when I left the practice, I went back a few weeks later. <laughs> Over there. But it's got to be a voluntary thing. Maybe even you think we're going to give up cakes and biscuits for a month, or a week, or a day, or one day a week. Something about clearing our, um, our, our workplaces of manufactured products. And how many of you have got children? Yeah. So, so when, you, when you have the children over, just trying to cook them real food and trying to resist buying manufactured products. Uh, how many of you have got grandchildren? Okay, so think about everything you can give them as a treat that isn't, uh, isn't sugary or isn't, um, you know, like junk food. Just think about non-food treats. Um, so, so in my class of 86, which there were 200 of us, and we sat in a lecture theatre very like this, uh, there was only one overweight person, and she was actually only overweight at the beginning of the course, and by the end she was a normal weight. So we actually had nobody, one in 200 um, sort of 23-year-olds, whereas now we've got one in five five-year-olds and, and one in three 11-year-olds who are overweight, which is just shocking, and, and two in three adults. So, I mean, how are we going to get through this when Public Health England are telling everybody to eat non-essential foods which make the fatter people fatter? I don't know. And, and the, the lobby your schools. Speak to your schools about it. Yesterday I was at a special school and I spoke to, um, I was invited along by the Board of Trustees and also by the parents. I spoke to them about giving the children real food for breakfast and the children needed protein and fat foods like eggs and, and uh, fish and meat and vegetables and they didn't need packaged products. And uh, they were intrigued really and they've invited me along to see if we can speak to, I can speak to the chefs and redesign the menu. Uh, so go to all your schools and say, look, can we give our kids real food? Uh, breakfast clubs are terrible. They give rubbish. They think they do. They think they give real food. They give low-fat products. And a low-fat product won't do your children any good. And that's the thing. So, I mean, I haven't got any answers other than if all of you, and then you all speak to other people, and other people come to talks of ours, and they all lobby their schools and say, look, we want our children to concentrate well. We want our children to thrive. We don't want our children to be hungry mid-morning. Let's give them real food. And if, if they won't, we'll then take them out of school, school lunches and give them packed lunches or give them such a big breakfast they last till four o'clock when they come home. Because if you give your child a big breakfast, and my parents did it, and they had five children, and they both worked full-time, and they didn't have much money, they gave us breakfast every morning, which was cooked. And uh, it does keep kids going. Okay, so we've asked some of the, or those questions already. Um, a biggie is about sweets, biscuits, and cakes. Now, is there anybody here who never eats sweets, biscuits, and cakes? Okay, so good. Our message is getting through. That's brilliant. Um, I find most health professionals do eat them very frequently. And uh, like many people, they've got an addiction they haven't faced up to, or maybe they will. Maybe they will and say, well, yeah, no, I can't help it, or I'll stop one day, or yes, well, I only have, I can afford to. So this will shock you. So we've got a diabetes committee in my local, um, what's called CCG, who run the health service. And uh, I'm on this diabetes committee, and we've got the chair of the diabetes committee, and we're all sitting there, ready to discuss things that we're doing in the district. And he's sitting there with a bottle of full sugar Coke, <laughs> uh, swigging it, actually. And I'm thinking to myself, has he done this to be provocative? Is he being funny? Does he want me to react? Does he want me not to react? Or what am I going to do? So I just said, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and, he <laughs> and he said, um, I can afford to. And I thought, ah. No, you can't, because that is, you know, like 32 teaspoons of sugar or whatever. I don't know if it's, you know, something of that order. And what about your pancreas? What about your teeth? Um, what about the example to all the people on the committee? 
all right for you as well, I thought. All right for you because, you know, these other people struggle with their weight. Quite a lot of people on the committee are overweight. And I just thought, he's the chair of the committee. This is disgusting. It's absolutely ridiculous. So, um, so the trouble is we need to address the A word, which is obviously addiction. And we need to address habits because a lot of us have got an addiction which we can slip back into. So a lot of us follow low carb and we're happy with it, but certain things might push us back into eating these things again. Like I used to be, my name is Joanne and I am a carb addict. And in the past, I used to eat an awful lot of biscuits and cake and I used to love them. And my mum used to make the most fantastic biscuits and cake. And, um, and although she did make us cook breakfast every day, we had um, you know, lots of cake after school and so on. So when I was a young doctor, I used to go into reception in between patients, grab myself a coffee and a few biscuits, go back into my room, munch them, call the next patient in. And I used to do that, and I don't know how many biscuits I'd get through in a day, a lot. But I haven't had a single one for three years, uh, nor do I feel tempted, which is amazing. Uh, it's not like willpower, it's just I could look at them, you could put them under my nose, uh, there could be a big box of my favourite, ex-favourite ones there, I wouldn't eat them at all. But lots of my colleagues are addicted to processed food. And I think that inhibits them in tackling you about the processed food. Okay, so this is my garden, and my garden is totally neglected. I do absolutely nothing for it, and in 23 years, I do nothing more than cutting back the bushes. That's it, and somebody cuts the grass for me, but it's not me. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 it, and it, it thrives on neglect because it just uses rainwater, and it takes nutrients from the soil, and that's it. It's great. And uh, I reflected upon this because in the 23 years that my garden has been thriving, my patients, my family, my colleagues and my friends have not been thriving on the whole. Some have, but increasingly more and more become sick. And so when I started in my practice 23 years ago, 1% um, of my patients were diabetic. Now 7% of my patients are diabetic. Uh, when I started, all my staff were slim. They've changed over the years. Some have moved on. Uh, some have died because they were actually quite old when they started, but they were all slim back, in, uh, back at the beginning. And now quite a proportion are overweight. And I think there's a big problem with doctors receptionists being overweight because they are given biscuits and chocolates by patients. So don't do it. Give them flowers. <laughs> Make a point of saying, I'm not buying you biscuits this time end of, um, uh, but do, do other things for them, or uh, tell you what they absolutely love, a thank you card, they really, really love a thank you card, and probably, uh, I would think you de don't need to go to the doctors very often, but you might need to go over your, your mother, father, auntie, child, but if you're going to do anything for them, just, just write them a little note or give them a card, don't give them chocolates and biscuits, and I think that um, we in the NHS should stop allowing it, but it feels rude really. Oh, the animals in my garden. Yeah, so I don't have any pets, although I love them. My husband hates animals, uh, pets anyway. And, uh, and we have lots of animals that come through our garden. I mean, is there a single, you, you don't know the answer to this, there's not a single obese animal that's ever walked across my lawn. Oops. Okay, so this is me. Uh, that was me in 2012. And... The other picture was how, I mean, by, I started this in uh, probably November 2013, and uh, by the summer of 2013, uh, sorry, by the summer of 2014, I was uh, very slim. In fact, I got so thin that uh, my bones stuck out. People say, how do you know you're too thin? Well, when your bones stick out and you feel uncomfortable and you have to add, add in extra cushions, and when your husband prods you and says you're all skin and bone, you think, mm, maybe I've overdone it a bit. Um, so I've deliberately put on a bit of weight since then. But um, that picture was actually last year, uh, and here I am now. And the reason I put this up is for two reasons. One is that I didn't think I was overweight in 2012. I thought I was normal. And my friend Louise, the one from Manchester, the GP who had the patient last week with the Aid, she told me I was normal. But my husband found this photograph when he was looking through some holiday snaps and said, God, you're a bit of a podge, weren't you? <laughs> 
I was actually. Did I really look like that? And quite a lot of people who knew me at the time said, oh, you were never like that. But I think I was. Um, I was also very active. The other thing about that is that I was very active and I, I like, loved running and cycling even though I was overweight, so it made no difference to my weight. And the third observation is, okay, so it's been three years. I'm following something that Alison Tedstone and other people would say is an unsustainable way of life. And I'll stop it soon, won't I? Because I won't be able to do it and I'll gradually put weight on and be the same as I was before. But it's not a diet. It's a sustainable way of life that I enjoy. Now, this is be careful. And this is something about, we, we talk about N1s, we talk about randomized trials, which have thousands or hundreds of thousands of people in them. And, and we talk about N1s, which is just anecdotal accounts, like one person. So the way I've got better and improved my health won't be the same as you or you or you. Everybody has a different way but the low carb message is the thread through it all. You have to decide how low carb, and you have to decide how much protein you have and how much fat you have and whether you're still going to stay as a vegetarian or vegan and, and adapt it to this or whether you're going to eat a bit of meat or fish or whether you're going to stay as a meat eater like most people do who are already meat, meat and fish eaters. But it is very individual. And, and I've got a problem with randomised controlled trials and if your doctor says, well, the tests prove this doesn't work, I'd say, well, it works for me. And if it works for me, particularly if all my blood tests are normal and I feel healthy and I look healthy, great. And it doesn't matter if it doesn't work for other people, but it works for me. And I think there are too many variables um, in our bodies and in our minds to actually do a trial on a thousand people, look at the average and think that average applies to everybody. It doesn't. Because stress really affects whether we are able to change or not. Uh, so does how much we sleep, um, so does our DNA, and something called our microbiome. How many of you know what your microbiome is? Yeah. Okay, so for those of you that don't know, your microbiome is the name given to all the bugs that live in your tummy. And they outnumber your cells by about 10 to 1, so they're really, really important. And a healthy microbiome makes you healthy. And if you take a group of mice that are thin, and a group of mice that are fat, and you take, sorry if this offends any animal lovers here, I don't think it's very nice, but they took the microbiome out of the fat mice and put it into the thin mice, and the thin mice became fat. So I think that's quite amazing, really. And, and your microbiome's involved with cravings. So it comes back to the A word, to the addiction again. If you eat in a certain way, if you eat a lot of carbs, or if you go back to eating carbs, if you get carb creep and find yourself going back to eating carbs, um, then your microbiome will change, and it will make you feel you want to feel you crave the, the sugary starchy foods again and that's why important to think of it like stopping smoking set a quit date or think right I'm doing it now I'm not having any more and just don't give up on giving up and uh, there are other things involved as well like sunlight and it's very important to get enough sunlight get enough vitamin D uh, that that affects um, you know your general well-being and impacts on lots of illnesses um, but there are just so many variables with you. So it's not just thinking about what you eat and drink. It's also thinking about um, all the other things in your life. How can you reduce your stresses? Should you go to yoga? Um, if you're in a bad relationship, how can you make it better? Should you leave? There are all sorts of things that affect you, you and your well-being. So, so don't just think in terms of food and drink. Think in terms of you as a whole person and how you can improve your health through looking at all the different aspects. Okay, so that was my first aim, really, to see ourselves in you, look for any denial or addiction, to observe without judgment, because if we feel guilty about things, we're going to go into this cycle of good days and bad days, and good foods and bad foods, and feeling we've been good or feeling we've been naughty. And it's not about that, it's about observing, just without judgment. Just, how am I doing? If you want to have a piece of cake, and you don't usually, well, just have it and don't beat yourself up, it's only one piece of cake. And um, I think there's a danger in doctors and nurses and, and health, any sort of health clinicians not being honest with their, their, themselves. I mean, there is obviously with everybody. But do be honest with yourself. And, and uh, if any of you are healthcare professionals, think about whether the way you are impacts upon your patients. Like, we had, um, we had a group of dietitians in Warrington. I must say, Warrington has some fantastic dietitians who've embraced the low-carb message. And uh, if you want... Uh, if any of you have gotten friends in Warrington or family who want low-carb advice, if you ask them for low-carb advice, they'll give it to you. 
which is great. Um, but we did have one dietitian there a few years ago who was obese. And sometimes people ended up with her, and I hear some people smiling, but uh, patients would be really cross when they came back. They'd say, and? What are you playing at? She clearly doesn't know what to do. And the trouble is we've got lots of people giving health advice who clearly don't know what to do with their bodies, or they're not on the right point of change. You know, if you've got a healthcare professional who is overweight, say, I, I find this work for me. You know, and, and do it the other way around. Just, just do it the other way around. You know, it might not be, and I'll tell you it is in the guidance, but it's not obviously in the guidance, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you what to say to them that's quite, I think, quite good. Okay, so this is it. I'm a conventional healthcare worker. I'm a GP. I've been, I qualified in 1986, and, um, and I don't like rocking the boat or doing things that will get me in trouble. You know, I was always a good girl, and I didn't like doing something wrong. So when I first found out about this, I was a bit nervous. But I, I said to people, well, there are respected doctors through the world who are practicing who think this is a reasonable way to act, behave, eat, whatever. And you could follow them on the internet, and that would be fine. But I've actually got um, some pieces of information from the General Medical Council which support what we do. So this is it. Domain 1, 16B. We should provide effective treatments based on the best available evidence. Okay? So you can say, if you want to write it down, domain 116B, the best available ev evidence, your GP and nurse should follow that. Domain 2, safety and quality. Now this is of interest to me because I'm a process management doctor to do with safeguarding children and adults for Runcorn. If patients are at risk because of inadequate policies or systems, you should put the matter right if that is possible. Okay, so, so remember those, you've got 25B, you can look it up, GMC guidance, good medical practice, and 16B. So if any of your healthcare professionals challenge you over it, say, there you go. Um, you've also got NICE, so you all know what NICE is. Yep, National Institute for Clinical Excellence. So, so they come out with enormous tomes um, teaching us how to you know, do things properly. But I've noticed a change in tone with them over the last few years in a very helpful fashion. So they talk about individualised advice, personalised advice, in particular in relation to carbohydrates and alcohol, which makes sense. Because with alcohol, for some people, zero is the only thing that's safe. Because if they had more than zero, they'd be back on you know, the path to being a full-blown alcoholic again. And the same with carbohydrates. Some people are profoundly carbohydrate intolerant. So NICE is very supportive now. And there are two sections of the diabetes guidance from 2015, December. And hardly any doctors know this. So when you tell them about it, they'll say, really? I didn't notice that. And you'll say, oh, I know you get hundreds and hundreds of pieces of paper every day. There's far too much to read. But if you look at section 1.1.1, and 1.3.3, it will tell you what you need to know. And it says low GI, uh, individualized carbohydrate, and individualized alcohol recommendations. So that's how I do it as a conventional doctor. OK, so the next thing is about hope. So this is not my idea. This is the idea of Dr. Unwin, who's in the fourth row there, Dr. Jen Unwin. Do you want to stand up, Jen? And Dr. David Unwin, who for um, over four, maybe five years, have been running behavioural change classes in their, in their own time, uh, in their medical centre up in Southport. And so when I first do, started doing low carb, I thought, I wonder if there are any other low carb doctors in the UK. And obviously, if you want to find a low carb doctor, just Google low carb doctor near me or whatever, wherever you live. And uh, so I did this and I discovered Dr. David Unwin within the, you know, the first page. And so I just contacted him on the NHS net and said, oh, I'm another low-carb GP, thinking about the way ahead, what shall I do? And he invited me to one of his behavioural change classes, which was great. And, uh, and now I run them myself. And uh, it starts off with the idea of hope. And I'd like you, on your, um, on your desk, in front of you, you'll see these little cards. And these are cards I give out to my patients. And uh, the thing is, we don't have very long with our patients. We've only got 10 to 15 minutes. And so I can never say enough or listen enough. And so they've got this idea about hope on it. And it says, a year from now, and you're a lot healthier. 
What does healthier mean to you? And at first, if you ask them face to face, they'll say things like, I don't know, think about it for a minute and maybe Sam will go around with the microphone. So I don't know how healthy you feel at the moment, but if you could feel even healthier a year from now, uh, what would that mean to you? No back pain, yeah? No pain. Anybody else? More energy, yep. Yes, improve mood. So that's great. So the next step is, if you had those things, what could you do? What sort of things would you do if you were, if you were feeling healthier and you had improved mood, you had no back pain? Back pain's a good one. So if you had no back pain, what would you be able to do in a year? Lift heavier weights. Lift heavier weights. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Just move. Just move more. Be more active, yeah, that's absolutely right. So, so people have said the most amazing things to me. One lady said she'd like to go on a camel in Morocco because she'd always wanted to go there. Another one said, and I think this is one that maybe people don't say so often, so this is a very big lady, and she said, my dream is to go, on, um, to, go to Blackpool and go to the, uh, the, um, the, the Blackpool Tower, to the theme park, and I'd like to buy one of those really expensive tickets and take my son, and I'd like to be able to go on all the fastest, biggest rides uh, without any fear and I said oh what are you frightened of and she said well not fitting in the seats and not getting the bar down and I thought well that's such a lovely demonstration of how much better she would feel so so I run these classes and I have about 15 to 25 people and they're all people at my NHS general practice and uh, and I invite them all the staff know about it so we've got 16,000 patients so we've got a way to go uh, but they invite people along and if they can't come I don't insist on them doing a course of eight or whatever I just say look come along and see what you think you can come as often as you like and so um, we start off with their ideas their hopes their dreams and then we talk about low carb and we talk about behavior change habit change and maintaining habit change and so it's much more than food and drink. And um, for instance, uh, this week we had chair yoga and a bit of standing up yoga. If you want to stand up, Hema. So Hema Mystery, she uh, came along and did the yoga with them, which was fantastic. Really good. Another time we had a blogger um, uh, who's a health coach and she came along and talked to them about habit change. Uh, and we generate ideas, really. So, so I don't need to do all the talking. I can just... And I would say, this is the most amazing thing. I'm glad I've got an audience of mostly the public here. Some GPs, I know I've got Jeff there at the back. Um, hi. Um, but the most amazing thing is that they take it forward. You know, you don't have to do all the work as a healthcare professional. And actually, some of these people have started their own groups. So this week, I do my own group, which is running on an eight-week cycle, and then I go back to the beginning and do another eight-week cycle. But this week, I was invited along to a group in a pub. And the group in the pub was run by a guy who contacted me on the internet. And he's a guy called Phil Escott. And you can look him up on the internet, and he's written a book. And, uh, and he cured his arthritis, which was psoriatic arthritis, through eating, uh, eating differently, eating better. And also through other things about relaxation, stress reduction, and various other things. But he completely cured himself. And now he gets people to come along in his area to talk about better eating and other things like getting more sunlight, but right sort of exercise, all this sort of thing, and he invited me along. But isn't that amazing that people are doing it for themselves now because they're not getting it from their doctors and nurses? I think it's just incredible. So that was in a pub near here, um, up in um, Rainford. And then I met somebody else there who'd driven all the way from the Lake District, and he said he was going to set something up in the Lake District, and he'd been reading all about it. So, so lay people are learning all about this and teaching other people. So, so any of you could do that. It's, it is unregulated. You've got to be careful about what you say and make sure you get it right, really. But at the same time, you're giving people information. They can choose to use it. They can choose not to use it. It's not medical. It sort of makes sense, doesn't it? You know, everybody knows, once they've learned about it, there are no essential carbohydrates. Everybody knows real food sounds sensible and certainly not harmful. So, so that's what um, Phil Escott does, and that's what, you know, so I, I, I do get asked into these things as well. But in my medical centre, and you could speak to your, if any of you nutritionists here, you could speak to your practice and say, you know, you'd be willing to come in. You'd be getting, in a sense, if you did, a, say, say some of you did like an hour a week and you went in and talked to people, you'd be getting publicity for your business. Um, you would be um, getting, to, getting to know the nurses and doctors there, maybe inviting them along and getting them talking about things like real food and how you don't need carbohydrates. You'd get, get them au fait with the websites that exist um, for, for better living that are much more effective than the ones that are, that are churned out by um, the government machine. 
and um, we get a whole dialogue going in the country. This is a little bit about sharing ideas. So show them the individual evidence. So if you go to your GP and you've got um, you know, a printout of your weight loss or your blood pressure changes or your blood sugar changes, take them along. Your GP is a very, very busy person. And I don't say this, this to ex excuse them, but they're like hamsters on a wheel. Um, sometimes my husband comes home from work and he says, OK, so today I did 100 prescriptions, um, 56 letters, um, 35 patients face to face, uh, four home visits, and I did a telephone surgery of 20 people. I think, this is nuts, this is crazy. Um, so they do do an awful lot. But if you make their life easy, if you go in and you're opening gambit is, I won't keep you long, doctor. Um, I'll give you this information, which you can um, maybe give to somebody to put into the computer later. But it shows how I've lost two stone, my blood sugar's gone down from you know, an average of 12 to an average of six or whatever. And, and, uh, and these are my blood pressures. And you know, if you actually give that to them and say, I'm doing really well, you know, I've taken your advice, I've lost weight. And uh, I didn't follow a balanced diet, but I am actually eating real food. They'll think, they'll think great. They actually won't know what real food is. So, uh, <laughs> if you know what I mean. So, uh, so these cards were. You can see you've got one. You should have one of these next to you as well. So on one side they've got pictures, and on the other side they've got words. They're not strictly LC. They're certainly not LCHF really. They're more real food, but they're a really big start. And I'm preaching to the converted here because you're already doing real food. But some of your friends won't eat real food, uh, either because they're frightened of getting fat or because they're busy or stressed. Or OK, thanks, Sam. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so when I started giving these out, so I give these out to patients. They were developed for people with low literacy and people with English as second language. But quite a lot of my doctor friends have said, I'll put that in my handbag and use it for myself, or I'll put it in my fridge which is quite interesting. And um, yeah, so any comments? If you want to go uh, even lower carb, obviously you have to cut down the sweet stuff like the fruit and so on. OK, so, so there was a little bit about I'm um, sharing with healthcare professionals. So there's something about keeping it simple. Um, for any doctors or nutritionists here, if you're going to show a doctor evidence and want to persuade them, just give them something for later. Um, Dr. Bruckner, who's here, was saying he keeps books in his car and says, are you interested in reading about it, and gives them a book. Um, I have done that. Um, Karen Zinn gave me a, a big supply of What the Fat books, and I gave them out to people. Um, also, just giving them graphs. I just want to show you this graph of this patient and how, like, my patient who went down from HbA1c of 100, 110 plus down to sort of 60 odd, um, give them a graph just in passing in the corridor or whatever, or, or leave it out and show it in the, you know, in the practice meeting at the beginning. Um, but uh, oh, and, and remind them about the nice guidance. And I also use evolving business cards. So this one, you'll see, obviously, on one side, it says a year from now, and you're a lot healthier. What does healthier mean? But then the other side, it says for help, help achieving your goals, because I've only got 10 to 15 minutes with each patient. I want to give them something to go away with. And my website, fastasmyfriend.co.uk, is a portal for other health information, as well as being a small blog. And it's a small blog of my behavioral change program. OK, so. Um, each week, just, just in a nutshell, because you could do this sort of thing yourselves if you wanted. Um, it's a simple behavioural change programme. Each week we have a recipe. We've got food to try from a low-carb website. Um, we talk about sleep and stress reduction. That's why we had the yoga. And they get monitored. This is very important for any healthcare professionals. Um, we want to monitor people, or rather ask people if they'll agree to have their, all their blood tests monitored to prove they will only have to do this now because people don't believe it, but to prove it works. Obviously, if people don't want to be monitored, they can quite happily get better and go away and not worry about it. But if they agree to be monitored, then we do monitor them. And we monitor things like, um, uh, obviously, the weight, the waist measurements, uh, the blood pressure, the lipids, uh, the thyroid, uh, the kidney function, liver function, and liver function um, works really well. And the other thing I've tried to do is not insist people come every week because uh, people's lives are busy and some of them will only want to come once. Some people are really clever and they just get it just like that. And my best results, my quickest results, were a lady who, uh, a lady came to me and I said, oh, your diabetes, it's not so good really. And she said, oh, I just can't control it. It's terrible. She was a lady who was on insulin. And uh, 
I said, oh, so tell, talk me through your day. This is my classic. Talk me through your day in terms of what you eat and drink. So she had the classic of porridge for breakfast and a sandwich for lunch and pasta and chicken for tea or fish. And I said, oh, I said, the thing is you're carbohydrate intolerant. It means you can't process those things like pasta and porridge and everything. Quite hard to keep your blood sugar low. And she said, do you know, I hate that stuff, doctor. <laughs> I only eat it because I thought it was healthy. So I've done about that. And the surprising value of the internet. Yeah, so the surprising value of the internet is this. So, so we've got this thing called therapeutic nutrition for people who think we're a bit sort of like, ooh, and, you know, doing fatty stuff. And um, we're proper doctors. I'm a conventional doctor who wants to do the right thing. And, um, and I want to make sure I don't do anything wrong. And I just go along and have support of professional colleagues. And so we've got quite a few good things we can, we can use, like dietdoctor.com, which is devised by a doctor, diabetes.co.uk, um, large sections of which are written by doctors. Um, and then we've got, obviously, I've put my website there. Zoe, Zoe Harkham is a, is a, a doctor in nutrition. Uh, she's, she's extremely highly qualified about nutrition. And, uh, and so her website is, is very solid. And so we, we need these things. And, and through the internet, we can meet a lot of other people. You know, go on to all of you are not on Twitter and have a Twitter account. I've got a silly Twitter name, which is at Joanne Reynold 14, because I was so embarrassed about doing it and was sure I'd get it wrong that I picked my married name because I thought nobody would know me. <laughs> but, but I'm also called Fat as My Friend. So you can see the Fat as My Friend um, sort of strap line. And through that, I've, I've, I've uh, Got, got to see quite a lot of scientific studies and, and made contacts with people around the world like Dr. Jeff Gerber at the back there who's the Denver Diet Doctor uh, and, and, um, and uh, so many other people like so I only know the Unwins because of, because of the internet. Uh, and I think in terms of us as the public getting the message out, we should use the internet, you know, Facebook groups and, and Twitter and, and Instagram and Snapchat and, and talk to our younger people about it because the next generation's been failed by that ridiculous eat well plate or eat, eat badly plate. It's just so-called, the so-called eat well plate. But um, if you just, we've probably got, what, one minute left. Fire me your questions about low carb. Five minutes, have we? Okay. So I thought if you just fire me your questions about low carb, because I imagine you've got quite a few, those are our websites. And if any of you want to join who are doctors who are dietitians who want to join our uh, hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance uh, Google group, please do. Uh, just email me or Dr. Unwin or Dr. Campbell Murdoch and we can join you. Um, and I think that's the end of it, apart from just your questions. Okay. Right, Sam's going around the microphone. How open, to, how open are your colleagues to this message? Well, it was actually surprisingly easy. Um, when I first um, read about I, I did Grain Brain first and did it myself, obviously, and I went to the diabetes lead in our practice, Liz, and I said, oh, Liz, I think I need to talk to you. I think we've got it wrong about diabetics. I think this what we're what we're doing with them is wrong. And she said, I know. <laughs> I said, oh, right, OK. She said, um, I, for the last sort of six months, I've been reading all the work of Zoe Harkham. And um, so Liz knew through you, Zoe. And, and so the two of us together just immediately said, well, let's talk to the partners and nurses. So it was actually very easy. Then within Warrington, what I haven't talked about, because it's more of a public meeting, you know, it's um, not so many doctors here. But what I did was I set up a series of lectures uh, for mostly doctors and nurses, but also for any interested members of the public. So I called them Food as Medicine, and I ran them in the evenings, and I got sponsorship. So I think I had about seven of them evening meetings, and I got a variety of sponsorship from, like some from the local CCG, which holds our budget, and um, some from uh, Hannah, Hannah Sutter, who's from the Natural Low Carb Kitchen, and one from a drug company. I actually want to get into meter companies sponsoring us as well, but actually I haven't had anybody who said you're wrong. I've had plenty of people who said you can't do it, as in um, I don't want to, I couldn't, so nobody else could. I've had a lot of those. Um, but I say, well, Give people a choice. You know, say to your, you're not, you're not your patient. Say to your patient, there's this other way. 
Uh, my husband does. My husband isn't a low carber, but he does um, direct patients to my website and to other websites like Zoe's and, and Diet Doctor. And, uh, and he does say to me sometimes, oh, could you contact this patient with all the you know, useful information? So even though he is pretty much addicted to quite a lot of carbs, he's better than he was, but, um, but he still will take on that message. Um, I, I, at the beginning, I had quite a few who said, oh, but it's not in the guidance. And I say, that's what you think. Uh, and, uh, and I would direct them to 1.1.1 you know, and 1.3.3 and, and also to the GMC guidance and good medical practice. And, and they would soon like, oh, right, OK. Um, but old habits die hard. And I think sometimes we're trying to run, it's a bit like trying to run a drug addiction clinic with people who are, some of whom are addicted to drugs and who are running the service. And that's a big problem. It's a really big problem. You know, if you've got an overweight nurse or doctor running a diabetes service, or, or just as bad, a slim nurse or doctor who eats a bad diet but thinks if only they exercised as much as me, they'd be fine. And, and this is the trouble. There are lots of us who are current addicts and there are lots of us who are ex-addicts. The ex-addicts are the best, in my opinion. I mean. but, uh, but it doesn't. if you've never been one, well, you can understand it, can't you, to be fair? Hi, I'm a nutritional therapist. And I just want to point out in the pack that we got, and remember the band, British Association for Applied Nutrition and Nutritional Therapy, and we're actually doing this GP engagement um, program where we're actually wanting to make sure that nutritional therapy is actually involved in um, the practice of, of doctors, and I know there's going to be a talk tomorrow about that as well, so to draw your attention. Thank, thank you. Yes, yes, I am, and thank you very much. That's great. I mean, the more people who go into general practice with the real food, um, proper nutrition message, the better. And just one line here: uh, we have forgotten the purpose of food in this country. We think food is something you eat just till you get the right to be the right weight, and then you stop and you exercise enough to try. And food is for nutrition. It's not just something to give you energy. And, I, and somebody said to me the other night, he was surprised that your brain needed calories because it's not running anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating, thank you very much. Uh, I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts about your conversation that you have with the vegans and vegetarians. Okay. Well, I think the very first thing is it's a, I say to them, is it an ethical choice or a health choice? And if it's an ethical choice, I think, well, well, that's mostly I just say, well, that's. If it was a, it was, it's a difficult one because people are very, they love their vegetarianism and their veganism. They really, really love it. And, and it's something that's very special to them. It becomes part of their identity. And, and in my conversations with Zoe over time, uh, I've learned about, um, I learned about um, Lear Keith. Yes, Lear Keith wrote a book called The Vegetarian Myth. And Lear Keith used to be a vegetarian. And, and, and apparently, I mean, I can't say I'm, I'm sort of on the fence about this, but apparently it's much better for the planet to eat meat and have ruminants and, and cows to roam around and so on. And it's much better to eat some meat. But, but with vegetarians, I tend to think they're ethically, they, they're really wedded, if they're really wedded to it, and they've been doing it a long time, I say, well, just see how your body goes. Because if your body becomes sick, then you have to think, what am I missing? And, and you know, if they're interested in it, they can get apps to find out about all their, their nutrition and make sure that they're up, you know, getting enough. Um, but um, you can do low carb as a vegetarian. I mean, I think the main thing is cut out the processed food. I mean, a lot of people who, like Zoe, will say, yeah, cut out the processed food. Zoe will say you can be a vegetarian and eat real food, and, and you can be a vegan and eat real food. The danger is you could become nutritionally deficient in something. Um, so that's, um, that's a consideration. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. I'm sure you'd be. If, if any of you want to ask questions afterwards, questions. I think we need to finish for lunch. But if any of you want to ask questions, I'll be here for a while. Yeah, thank you very much.